Today on Straight Talk Africa, the Zika virus, the World Health Organization declares a global emergency over the disease, and U.S. President Barack Obama is asking Congress for nearly $2 billion in emergency funding to help fight the virus in the U.S. and elsewhere. Delving into the threats of the Zika virus is next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa Live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, February 10th. I'm Esther Gidu. You are sitting in for Shaka Sali. Well, happy Wednesday and welcome to Straight Talk Africa, Esther. And hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today we'll talk about the Zika virus. So much to cover coming up later in our STA inbox. Well, we'll share your thoughts on our topic through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued a new warning for men about transmitting the Zika virus. The virus is spreading rapidly in Latin America and the Caribbean, creating a crisis for pregnant women. VOA's Carol Pearson reports very little is actually known about the virus. The Centers for Disease Control is warning men to use condoms or to abstain from sex if their partners are pregnant and if they live in or have traveled to countries where the Zika virus is spreading. The same goes for men whose partners might become pregnant. The latest advice only highlights that very little is actually known about Zika and sexual transmission. We don't know whether it's a rare event. We don't know how long someone is infective and in being able to transmit it sexually, whether that's when you're acutely ill, is it persist when a week later, a month later, or two months later, we don't know that. Another unknown, the link between Zika and microcephaly, a rare condition in which a baby's brain stops developing. We don't know the, de the degree of the connection, whether it's truly causal, whether there's Zika plus something else which is resulting in the microcephaly where it's Zika interacting with something else or if it has nothing at all to do with Zika. We don't know for sure. Zika is new to the Americas, but the mosquito that carries the virus thrives in Latin America and the Caribbean. So you had the perfect storm, a naive population to the particular infection, a real problem with mosquito and mosquito transmitted diseases. Fauci says the virus itself is inconsequential. 80% of the people have no symptoms, and the 20% that do have symptoms, the symptoms are very mild, self-limited, with very few sequelae. And now more bad news. It can be transmitted through blood transfusions. Pregnant women especially are cautioned to cover up and use insecticide. Meantime, governments are conducting aggressive mosquito control programs. If you eliminate or suppress the mosquito, you'll put an end to the outbreak. And you could do that by killing the mosquito with larvicide or insecticide or preventing the mosquito from breeding. Until more is known about the virus and until a vaccine is developed, which is years away, that's all that can be done. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Carol Pearson, for that report. Joining us here in the studio are my distinguished guests, Josh Michel with the Kaiser Family Foundation, Dr. Ronald Waldman, a professor at George Washington University, and Carol Pearson, VOA's health reporter. Welcome to you all. Uh, in, later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111, and the U.S. country code is one. Uh, Carol, turning to your package there, you talked to Dr. Fauci, and it, it, he makes very interesting remarks. I'm curious to know what other issues did he share with you regarding the Zika virus? Well, we were talking about the fact that someone said they found the mosquito that can carry Zika in the Washington area, and he said that that was inconsequential, as is the virus itself, because Zika does not normally kill people unless it's got, uh, unless the person has some sort of compromised immune system 
and uh, is has fragile health anyway. Uh, he he views the virus as inconsequential except for this potential link between Zika and microcephaly. Doctors are also looking at the link between Zika and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a kind of paralysis. And Josh, turning to you here, one of the issues coming up as you go through the Zika virus, which is an outbreak mainly in South America, we've seen that in Uganda, back in Africa, and we'll get back to one of the doctors talking about that. Mm -hmm. But one of the concerns is once it's diagnosed, since uh, as Carol talked to Dr. Fauci, there seems to be no vaccine, no really known treatment. Once you're known to have Zika virus, what do you do next? What kind of treatment actually is available? Well, um, as you said, there really is no treatment available right now. So um, it really depends on who you are if you are diagnosed. And, and, and the danger, as Carol was saying, is for pregnant women. And uh, so if you are a pregnant woman who is diagnosed with Zika, uh, that would be the time to speak with a medical professional, uh, perhaps confirm the test if it already hasn't been confirmed, uh, and discuss your options. But treatment, unfortunately, is not one of them. But the status can be monitored. The infection itself doesn't cause any serious complications to the person infected except for this link to uh, birth defects. And so uh, it, it really is uh, pregnant women who are at risk here. Uh, others may be infected, uh, but if you're not a pregnant woman, the, the, that link to uh, this birth defect uh, you don't have to worry about the serious complications. We'll get back to that definitely because one may want to know what happens to the child that is, you know, has microcephaly. I mean, once the sonogram is done and you know that your child is infected, what do you do next? But then, uh, Dr. Ron, let's uh, get to you. And we've heard about uh, cases of sexually transmitted uh, Zika virus now. Uh, how, wh what more do we know about this and how can that be prevented? We know very little. It can be prevented by practicing safe sex, but I think it's important to say from the outset that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is a mosquito-borne disease primarily. There have been a few cases, one of which is fairly well documented of sexual transmission, but the uh, feeling on the part of public health authorities now is that this does not represent and will not represent a very important mode of transmission, that in the long run, what we have to do is concentrate on what are the majority, the vast majority of cases which are transmitted by a mosquito from one infected person to another susceptible person. Is gender an issue here? That if a man has the Zika virus, is the one likely to transmit this to the woman, or does it go both ways? I, I don't know. We don't know. We don't know yet. As Dr. Fauci said, there are many, many unknowns that need to be investigated that should be investigated in the very short-term future, and many of the appropriate studies, in fact, have already begun. Carol, you did talk to Dr. Fauci about microcephaly. Uh, I don't know if he gave you some insight into what happens, because we know here in the U.S., once you are pregnant and you do the sonogram, sometimes they tell you the child is not safe, and you have the option of, do I, you know, abort? Or what happens next? Did he give you any insights into the microcephaly? Well, I also, I also mm. talked to mm. the medical director of the March of Dimes, which is an organization that has worked to prevent birth defects. And uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Edward McCabe both said that, you know, they think the most critical part is in the first trimester if a woman gets Zika, but they haven't done enough studies to know, you know, if that is in fact true, but that's when the baby's brain is developing. And the reason the baby has a small head is because the brain has stopped developing at some point. Now, you can have a small head. In fact, we were talking about this before the show. You can have a small head, but have normal or even superior intelligence. And the March of Dimes recommends that, that these babies be fully evaluated by competent professionals. And then, if they need physical therapy, speech therapy, some, they have developmental delays. If they need any kind of therapy, it's best to start it very early on so that the baby has the best chance of becoming as fully functioning a person as that child can become. Josh, if you may weigh in on uh, the challenges probably facing most of South America, 
uh, where the Zika virus has been uh, found. Uh, I would think it's very similar to some of the challenges that we face from the African continent where most people don't have access to health. And so I'm just wondering what really do governments need to know? What should they put in place to be able to at least contain the spread of the virus? Yeah, we're in an unfortunate situation in that uh, we have so many unknowns as we've heard. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that we don't have a good test to diagnose Zika uh, easily and rapidly. Uh, so it's very difficult to know exactly how many cases are in a country or in a location and how quickly it may be spreading, although we have a general sense that it has spread rather quickly across Latin America. Um, so governments uh, right now are really focusing on, on several things. Uh, one, doing better job of, of surveillance setting up some studies to make sure that this link between Zika infection and microcephaly uh, is, is a real link and providing some, some more evidence to that link, um, as well as providing uh, recommendations uh, on, on how people can uh, prevent uh, mosquito bites and therefore prevent being infected in the first place, uh, and setting up mosquito control programs, uh, stepping up those control programs, and also doing some public uh, health education programs uh, and we've seen those kinds of efforts happen across Latin America. And uh, should Zika rise up as a real problem in the African continent, I would expect the same to be true. Mm -hmm. Esther, if yes. I can, I was wondering if our guests would know. I mean, when you compare the health facilities in West Africa, Liberia, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone, and uh, Guinea, during the Ebola outbreak, when we know that hospitals didn't have electricity, didn't have necessarily running water, there weren't enough treatment facilities. I mean, it, it, and they had just come out of long wars. But compare this to Latin America and the Caribbean, where there haven't been wars, where the language is the same. I mean, they have a common language in Spanish. And, and what, is that helpful in, in, um, hunting down the Zika virus. I, I would think, Dr. Ron, you've done some studies uh, relating to WHO findings and how they, were, they treated the Ebola virus in West Africa. Probably you can give us an insight into what Carol is uh, referring to. Well, first of all, Latin America, like Africa, is not one thing. It's a very diverse and very heterogeneous uh, geographical area. Uh, it has um, many rich countries. It has some of the poorest countries in the world, in, in the Caribbean. It has uh, rich people and poor people within each country. There are tremendous inequalities within the country. So while it's true that most people do have very limited access to health care and are the most vulnerable, therefore, to, to the consequences of diseases like Zika, there are also very good facilities. So I think to say can we compare the Ebola affected areas to South America? It, it, it's difficult to say. In some levels we can, in some levels we cannot. That said, I want to make sure, I'd like to make sure that people understand that the problem with this disease is not the disease itself. And in fact, the World Health Organization has not declared Zika virus disease to be a public health emergency of international concern. They have declared the cluster of microcephaly that was detected in northeastern Brazil to be a public health emergency of international concern. That's why there's so much focus on trying to establish this association. That cluster of cases in Brazil would be an emergency whether or not it turns out to be caused by the Zika virus. It's conceivable that after the studies are done, there might be a different cause mm -hmm. identified. We don't know for sure. Yeah, the yeah, disease yeah. itself, as has been said here and as Dr. Fauci said, is not a very serious thing for adults. It's a short term. It lasts at the most a week. It's a uh, virus that causes a... Um, a, a headache, a rise in temperature or fever, a fleeting rash all over the body, joint pain, and after about a week the symptoms subside. There have been no deaths from Zika virus disease itself. There have been no deaths recorded. I think it's important that people understand that and that the problem that we're facing is understanding more what the consequences of this disease might be whether they be the congenital malformations that might be microcephaly or whether it be what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome 
an immune system attack on a person's nervous uh, on a person's nervous system that results in paralysis, and that if it paralyzes the muscles that are important for breathing, can result in the death of a person. All right, let's take a short break now. But we would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter, and we're tweeting live. Follow us at BOA Shaka. That's BOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag BOA Zika virus. And we're still on Facebook. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Indeed, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. We're discussing the Zika virus. Now let's get the African perspective. VOA spoke to Dr. Julius Lutwama, a virologist from Uganda. Let's take a listen. Well, the Zika virus was um, first isolated in Uganda in 1947. The virus that has been circulating now that which is causing problem from my, my understanding it is the virus that came from southeast asia it went into micronesia from micronesia it went into uh, polynesia then from polynesia it has moved into south america in many parts of africa you have Aedes aegypti because they have strains which are different. There is Aedes aegypti which mostly occurs in West Africa and along the East African coast. These are mosquitoes which are very, very efficient in transmitting uh, flaviviruses. The flaviviruses include dengue, yellow fever, uh, West Nile, and of course uh, Zika virus. So these are mosquitoes which are very, very efficient transmitters. This is a disease where you get infected and you may not know that you have been infected. Because you get a slight fever, you may get muscular pains, you may get pain in the joints, you may get a rash, you may get some blood oozing into the eyes, which is normally called conjunctivitis. But this only occurs in about 15 to 20% of the people who are infected. So the other people who are infected do not show these symptoms. Dr. Lutuama talks about symptoms that are very similar to other diseases, especially if you think about malaria. Uh, Dr. Ron, you mentioned those two. What really isolates the Zika virus symptoms from others? Well, malaria, of course, can be much more severe, and malaria is also transmitted by a different species of mosquito. So uh, Dr. Lutuama is absolutely correct. Only about 20% of people who are infected with Zika virus do demonstrate any symptoms at all. I would say that although it does have features in common with malaria, its clinical presentation is closer to uh, other diseases that are carried by the same species, the Aedes species of mosquito. And those would be, uh, as the doctor mentioned, dengue uh, and uh, chikungunya fever. But it's important so that um, it, 
Dengue is a disease that has spread now pretty much around the world, and that is a very important disease in and of itself. It kills more than 20,000 people each year. So I think that the focus that is now placed on Zika virus, if it leads to mosquito abatement interventions in areas where the Aedes gypti mosquito circulates, that can have a very beneficial effect uh, in, de in helping to control other conditions of which the clinical symptoms are more severe than they are for Zika. Mm -hmm. Josh, you wanted to say something uh, about uh, some of those comments we saw with uh, Dr. Lutuama. Well, I, think, and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think Ron uh, summarized it, is it pretty well. Um, there might be a few distinguishing features, but uh, it's never good to diagnose an infectious disease based upon the outward symptoms alone because many of them do overlap. Um, so, as I said, mentioned before, unfortunately, we don't have a very good rapid test for, for Zika right now. I know there's work being done on that uh, to, and to improve that, uh, but at the moment, uh, we may, for many people, have to rely on the telltale signs and symptoms that we just discussed. And, Carol, you've talked to various uh, health experts about this so far, and uh, you could give us a little insight into that because one of the things you realize is that most of the tweets, and uh, I'm sure Mariama will take this from the social media uh, uh, questions coming in, is uh, there are people in Africa asking what's the difference, like uh, Dr. Ron just talked about, the malaria causing mosquito is not the same one as the one causing the Zika virus. Uh, your insight into some of the uh, health experts. Well, yes, and there's actually kind of some good news in this, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that, in that dengue, chikungunya, and uh, Zika, West Nile are all belong to the same family of viruses and there had been research in the United States to develop a vaccine for West Nile uh, out of NIH. They have grantees that, that were working on it. So now they've, they've got the structure. It's the same kind of virus. You can then trans, you know, see if you can swap out the next, the West Nile portion for a Zika you know, the DNA, it's a DNA virus, so you can then start trials. They expect to have uh, clinical trials, a phase one clinical trial, either started or completed by the end of August. So then you can move into phase two, and what this will do eventually, hopefully, is develop vaccines for the other related viruses, which were much more serious than Zika. And uh, in our conversation earlier, you did want to ask about the connection between the Gillian Barre syndrome and uh, the Zika virus, and yeah, which so Dr. Ron mentioned. syndrome has been reported. So it, it's quite interesting what's happening, and it's very early on in the development of this story. Because the cases of microcephaly, as was mentioned before, have been identified in Brazil and particularly in northeastern Brazil. Zika virus is circulating very rapidly across the Americas, including the Caribbean. But microcephaly has not been detected in other countries, only in Brazil. It may be because the detection of microcephaly would lag by the nine-month gestation period mm -hmm. of the pregnancy. And we haven't been that far out. In Colombia, for example, where there's quite a lot of Zika virus, uh, there hasn't been any microcephaly, but it's been less than nine months since the virus was introduced. Colombia, however, has detected a very increased uh, number of Guillain-Barre cases, as has Brazil and one other country. So uh, it's not clear exactly what the magnitude of the consequences of this infection are yet, and that's why it's important, in my opinion, that the World Health Organization has focused attention on this issue by declaring that cluster of microcephaly a public health emergency of international concern, because that will help countries to coordinate the development of surveillance systems and to be able to collect and analyze information and share that information across countries and across regions of the world much more rapidly than might be the case if it had not focus the world's attention on this issue. And Josh, as uh, we, we keep learning, uh, getting new information about the Zika virus, there's also uh, information about the connection between blood transfusion and the Zika virus. I mean, how concerned should people be when they have to get a blood transfusion? 
Well, just like all the other modes of transmission, uh, we don't have a lot of information about how often Zika can be transmitted through, say, a blood transfusion. Um, you may have heard that we, we, Brazil has come out with some research saying that Zika virus has been detected in saliva and urine. Um, we know several cases of sexual transmission at this point, um, and we know that uh, it's commonly transmitted through mosquitoes. What we don't know is the relative uh, risk from each of these modes of transmission. Right now it appears that uh, the mosquito-borne infection, the, the, the bites from the mosquito, is the primary way, uh, the, the predominant way by which Zika gets transmitted. There may be uh, rare instances where it's transmitted by a sexual transmission. There doesn't seem to be any evidence yet uh, for transmission through, say, kissing and, and, and uh, saliva. Uh, as far as blood transfusions go, there seems to be some evidence for that. But again, it's very difficult to say, and it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but we don't have enough information to say how risky is it. Uh, and well, Dr. Fauci says you never say never about things like this. He was at the White House earlier this week, and he was also comparing it to the HIV virus. You don't get it through kissing. You can't get it through tears or saliva or urine, and the sexual transmission and exchange of bodily fluids, blood, is the primary way that virus gets transmitted. He said you could assume, but he didn't want to rule out, that the Zika virus might follow that. Uh, Ron, how about controlling the mosquitoes? Is fumigation enough, or? Well, I don't think it's enough, but it's one of many, and it may not be the preferred method of control either, because it involves uh, spraying pesticides in the environment, which may have its own consequences. So I wanted to come back to the malaria question for just one second sure. to say, and because it's related, the mosquito issue is really key to this. So I wanted to make sure that people understand that what it means that when we say that these are two different species of mosquitoes involved between malaria and Zika virus, mosquitoes behave very differently. And malaria is so important on the African continent that everyone is familiar with the recommendations that people should sleep under bed nets, and particularly insecticide-treated bed nets. For this family of viruses, dengue and chikungunya and Zika virus, sleeping under bed nets does not do very much good because these are mosquitoes that bite people outdoors during the daytime whereas the Anopheles mosquitoes that have their range in Africa and that cause malaria bite people indoors and at nighttime. So we have to learn a lot more about the behavior, not only our own behavior, <laughs> but about the behavior of mosquitoes as well, which might not be so easy to do. So coming back to the control measures, yes, there are a number of things that people can do. Mosquitoes breed in water. It's another difference between these species, and this species, the Aedes species, is again particularly nasty in that it can breed in very, very small bodies of water. If I left my cup of water outdoors overnight, mosquitoes could breed in even something, a body of water, if you will, as small as this. So that's why the general spraying may be okay, but that won't reach places where there are small amounts of water under homes, for example, where mosquitoes can breed. So it's quite important also that people pay attention to their own local environment and that they clear up as much as possible any small places of water inside tires, for old tires that might be outside the home, inside any small containers, plates or dishes that they may leave outside. It's very hard for people to do this but that's the way to reduce the mosquito population. And then, of course, people can take their own measures. It's important that people dress, for example, appropriately and that they cover themselves to the extent possible. If it's possible to use insect repellent, that's another way to avoid being bitten as well. So there is a variety of interventions that constitute what people can do for mosquito control, for insect control in their, envi in their homes and in the environment in general. But, Ron, doesn't this mosquito also live indoors? It likes to hang out it, indoors? It depends. Some in, it, it can. It, has, it does things differently in different, places, in different places as well. But for the most time, it's a daytime biter. And it, it prefers to bite daytime. That includes the very early part of the day, dawn and dusk as well. It, it can be inside or outside. 
Okay, let's take a short break again. You're tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. But first, here's Maria Madiello. Well, thanks, Esther. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan. Abdullah Keita from Monrovia in Liberia writes, I want to know how Zika is spread from one person to another and if there is any treatment or prevention method for the disease. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. And welcome back to Straight Talk Africa Live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter. Over to you, Mariama. Well, thanks, Esther. The World Health Organization has declared a global emergency over the spike in cases of microcephaly as it might be connected to the Zika virus. Most people who contract the virus have mild fever, skin rash, and conjunctivitis, which generally last for two to seven days. It is suspected, and I have to insist on that, but not officially proven of causing a birth defect that results in babies born with abnormally small heads. Well, this leads us to our question of the week, which asks, what questions would you like to ask doctors about the Zika virus? Well, before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for using all our social media platforms to communicate to us. Uh, and another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA Zika virus. And if you haven't yet, uh, please uh, do follow us at VOA Shaka. And speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from King Chroma, who writes, I really want to know the cause and how it's transmitted from person to person. Another tweet uh, says, I want to know whether... Uh, the children being born had mental defects and uh, retarded growth. I'm going to take a look at one last one while we are at it, this time from Omerina Omeria, who says, Is it true it was first discovered in Uganda? Well, let's now turn to our Facebook followers. We'll go to a comment uh, from Kasuru uh, Charles from Mud uh, Horasan in Iran, who writes, does the Zika virus only affect uh, pregnant women? Well, Esther and guests, uh, obviously a lot of questions here. We have a range of them. Who wants to dive in? Thank you very much, uh, Mariema. They are great questions from our viewers, definitely. And uh, let me take a cue from one of our viewers here and ask you, Dr. Josh Michel, uh, how long does it take for one t to uh, show symptoms of Zika virus? Because we know even from a common cold, you get infected, but it takes you a couple of days before you can say, uh, something is not right with me. Well, there is some variation between the time uh, w from when you are bitten with a mosquito, say, that's carrying the Zika virus, and you begin to show symptoms. And that might range from a couple of days to maybe a week or, or a little bit more. But it's a fairly short time frame that we're talking about here where you would show symptoms. Now, one thing to note is that in apparently 80% of the people who are infected with Zika, uh, they don't show any symptoms whatsoever. Uh, and so they are actually asymptomatic. Even though they have been infected, the, the virus doesn't cause any symptoms uh, in their bodies. Uh, and among the 20% that do show symptoms, they have those mild symptoms that we've talked about, the, the rash and the, the red eyes uh, and, and the fever. Uh, so it, it, uh, it, it causes uh, symptoms only in a small proportion of the people. 
All right, Maria, but please share more of our audience feedback. Uh, great point there because there are cases where absolutely there are uh, no symptoms. Uh, let's move on uh, to uh, a comment uh, from John Segun in Lagos, Nigeria, who writes, what are the early symptoms of Zika and what measures can be taken to prevent an infection, especially in third world countries? Another Facebook comment uh, comes from uh, Peter Sishizia. Uh, in Zambia who posted uh, this question on our Facebook wall um, asking what can Africa do to prevent the Zika virus from reaching the continent? Once again, Esther and Guess, uh, some basic questions, uh, but questions. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Very great. I'm going to take the last one to, to Ron. What can Africa do? I think it's a really interesting <laughs> question because we've said before that the Zika virus actually has its origins in Africa. So to say how to prevent it from reaching Africa makes things a little difficult. It is in Africa, uh, as far as we know. The problem is not is that we really don't know the extent of the range of the virus, nor do we know what the consequences of the virus uh, are in different places. That's why surveillance is of absolute is the key to this whole enigma that we're facing. We have to have better surveillance in African countries. We have to know how many cases of Zika virus there might be. We have to know separately how many cases of microcephaly or Guillain-Barre there might be occurring in Africa. We have not shined the light on these conditions in most African countries. And I suspect that when we do, we will find more cases than we are currently aware of, but we don't know if it will be a few more or tens more or hundreds more or thousands more. We just don't know. So again, I think uh, the World Health Organization has done the right thing to bring the focus of the scientific community, of the media and of the public onto this worrying condition, worrying because it affects unborn children, and we'll be able, by having done that, to coordinate our efforts. The simple fact of the matter is, and I, I don't like to say this, but I'm afraid it's the truth, we don't have enough information yet to answer many of these very, very good questions that are coming from the viewers and listeners. All right, Carol, you wanted to say something before the break. Oh, no, it was just, we were talking about, um, so. about what would happen. Mm -hmm. The Zika virus, went from Southeast Asia and hopped across the Pacific until it got to South America, Brazil. And that was my question oh. for Dr. Fauci too. Mm -hmm. What happens because of international travel when this is reintroduced to parts of Africa? Especially when somebody travels even from South America to Africa or even from Africa to South America. I want to make the point about detection again because one of the places that it went to, there, there was it, there have been very few, only hundreds of cases reported since 1947 of Zika virus infection because, as we've said here several times, it's a rather mild disease and nobody's really paid very much attention to it. There was an outbreak in 2007 in a place called Yap Island in the South Pacific. And that was, a, it was less than 100 cases. And then in 2013, there was another outbreak in French Polynesia and the outbreak was documented. It was 300 and some cases, and they just reported the outbreak, and people more or less forgot about it. When the outbreak occurred in late 2015 in Brazil and seemed to be associated with microcephaly, the public health authorities in Brazil got in contact with the public health authorities in French Polynesia and said to them, did you see any cases of microcephaly or, or other congenital malformations. They didn't know. They hadn't noticed it at the time. But when they went back and looked at their records and found the p mothers of children uh, uh, who had been infected during that epidemic, they did find an increased rate of microcephaly and other congenital malformations. Mm -hmm. So this remains a, a situation where we're not going to know what has happened in the past until we look for it specifically. Mm -hmm. Interesting uh, observation there, Josh. Um, I think one important thing to note too is that in uh, the cases, uh, the outbreaks in Yap and French Polynesia that uh, Ron was talking about, 
Uh, since then, there have not been any cases uh, diagnosed of this virus. And, and really, uh, the thought is that because you've been infected once, you get immunity to the virus and you can't be infected again. So when it enters a population that hasn't seen the virus before, uh, people get infected, but then they're protected. Uh, we don't know all of the dynamics around this, but because across the Americas, nobody had seen the virus before, you had what's known as a naive population. So we, we seem to be experiencing this explosive growth in uh, populations where there is no immunity. Now, once the immunity builds up in a population over time, you would see less of an explosive outbreak or, or af actually absence of the virus. And because we don't know how much of the virus is in Africa at the moment, because surveillance isn't there, uh, it might be part of the answer is that there, the virus has circulated there, people already have immunity to the virus. But I think more study needs to be done on that question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mariema. Again, great observations there from our viewers. Let me turn to our, well, we've already talked to our experts. We'll get much more insight into the Zika virus. Mariema. Well, thank you, um, Esther, and thank you to our guests uh, for weighing in uh, onto our uh, audience's uh, questions. Uh, this will do it for today's social media segment. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, always for tuning in. And again, uh, thank you for clarifying uh, a bit uh, some of the aspects of the Zika virus for them. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, uh, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a, li a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, we'll discuss the Ugandan presidential elections with Shaka Sally in Uganda, along with our studio guest host, Esther Gijui Eward, and I. That's next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. And welcome back. I'm Esther Gidui Ewart, sitting in for Shaka Sali, who is on assignment. Today, we're talking about the Zika virus. Our distinguished guests are Josh Mitchell with the Kaiser Family Foundation, Dr. Ronald Waldman, a professor at George Washington University, and Carol Pearson, VOA's health reporter. Uh, I will go back to you, Dr. Waldman, because if Zika virus was reported, in, like 50 years ago in Uganda. Do we know then if the microcephaly was detected then and what really happened, what was done? Because we don't know much about that and it doesn't seem to have really gone across the region That's as right. much we as Ebola. Know we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we know that it was not detected or at least not signaled then. It may be, as Josh has said, that because it's such a mild disease that because it's been circulating for some time, in Uganda and probably neighboring countries in Africa that many people may have been infected with it, did not know about it, but have developed immunity to it. Now that the virus has managed to reach newer parts of the world where it has not been found before, it's encountering a population of people who have not, not been able to develop immunity and therefore maybe it is spreading more rapidly and more explosively. But again, we just don't have all the answers in yet by any means whatsoever. There was a meeting at the World Health Organization this morning where representatives from the Ministry of Health of Uganda pointed this out to the WHO authorities saying, we have had this virus since 1947. We have not seen microcephaly. We have not seen Guillain-Barre syndrome. Therefore, it must be something else was what the, the representative from the ministry said. We don't know for sure that it's something else, but it's important to say at this point in time that we don't know for sure that the cluster of microcephaly in Brazil and the cluster of Guillain-Barre in Colombia is in fact caused 
by the Zika virus. We don't like to use that word very much in public health and in epidemiology. It's difficult to establish a cause for a consequence. It seems likely at this point that there is enough of an association between these events, the introduction of Zika virus into Brazil and the rest of South America, and the increase in the number of cases of microcephaly and Guillain-Barre, that it warrants further intensive and rapid investigation. And that's where we're at now. And so what, what is the WHO recommending? Because one of the concerns when you read uh, some of the comments from our African audience, they are concerned about the Aedes uh, aegypti mosquito traveling from one region to another. How easy is that when you compare uh, with someone who is infected moving from one country or one region to another? Josh. Well, the, the mosquito already exists across much of the world at this point, um, especially in temperate and tropical regions. Uh, so uh, the, the vector, as they say, or the, the mosquito that can carry this virus is, is already present. So as you point to, the people have a role in this too. So uh, at some point an infected person likely um, came across the Pacific and brought the virus. Um, it's much easier for a person to carry the virus along in a plane, say, uh, than a mosquito to fly across the ocean and bring it. Um, so it, it, it really is a matter of, uh, in this case, uh, travel uh, and trade uh, and an increasing globalization across the world that has led to the circumstances where we've had this introduction into first the Pacific uh, area and now into uh, uh, Latin America. So I, I think the conditions have existed in Africa. The mosquito's been there. Uh, the virus has been there. Uh, but as we've said, we just don't know uh, how widely it's currently spread. Partly uh, there might be immunity existing in the population, therefore that's why we don't see outbreaks and we haven't seen these clusters of, of uh, birth defects associated with the virus. Uh, but more study needs to be done on this question. Carol, what are you getting from uh, your listeners when you delve into this topic? Some of the questions that you really didn't even, didn't even think about because, I mean, viewers come in with all manner of questions. They are using uh, all our social media platforms. What are some of their concerns? I think most people are concerned about whether they could get the Zika virus and if they could then transmit it. Uh, and, and that seems to be the, the biggest concern. Will I get the Zika virus? Will it spread where I live? And they're, they're concerned about the um, impact that it might have. And, and I think a lot of people really don't know how inconsequential this virus is, except for a possible link to birth defects, because as we've said numerous times, 80% of the people who get it don't know they have it. So it's kind of incons inconsequential as a virus. They don't show the symptoms, uh, like uh, Dr. Ron. You, you talk about, you've written uh, intensively about this, and I saw you've done some research too about WHO, and also how the Ebola virus ravaged West Africa, mm. and what needs to be done so we don't see another scenario yeah. like that. I think it's a different situation, and I do think that when it comes to the Zika virus and its consequences, I think the system worked. I think that the cluster of microcephaly was detected relatively early in northeastern Brazil. It was reported to the authorities. The authorities in Brazil, the Ministry of Health, reported it to the regional office of the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, and they reported it to WHO headquarters in Geneva. Work had already begun, collaboration had already begun as early as, as May of 2015 between the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization and authorities in Brazil. So I think that the system actually worked well. I think that we're living in a time when there's a lot of pressure on agencies to perform and WHO came under intense criticism because of its handling of the Ebola crisis in West Africa, where that disease was detected in December of 2013, but not acted upon by WHO until August of 2014. So an eight-month gap went by 
without WHO declaring that situation to be an emergency. And that's a disease that, as we know, ended up affecting tens of thousands of people and killing about 11,000 people. So uh, the situation is quite different. Now, WHO, I think, has been criticized by colleagues of mine regarding Zika virus for acting too early, for acting on political grounds rather than only on scientific grounds. I think that's absolutely uh, excusable <laughs> in this case. I think that there is an important combination and a link between the public health and scientific imperatives. And we've been saying here that we don't have enough science to be able to say definitively what the situation regarding Zika virus is. But I think that WHO had to act. As uh, the Director General, Margaret Chan, said, when declaring this uh, situation to be a public health emergency of international concern, she said, imagine what would happen if we did not do that. And then it became more important later on. Then we would have another situation in which WHO would be subjected to intense criticism and maybe even be dissolved. The organization wouldn't be able to continue. So I think it's, it's good that they did that. What happens now that they have made that declaration? Well, as I said, I think they'll be able to coordinate the efforts of different countries mm -hmm. much, much better. I think they'll be able to direct the uh, research efforts into the development of vaccines and potentially treatments, diagnostic tools. I, I think that they'll be able, most importantly, to provide us with some international leadership and guidance over what is likely to become an international problem as it plays out over the next few months. All right, let's take a call uh, from Patrick in Nigeria. Patrick, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. What's your question? Yeah, good evening. Uh, I want to find out from the doctor. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Patrick Kukura for here in Arochuku, Nigeria. I want to find out from the doctor. Doctor, do we say that this um, Zika virus, do they have special food? People who are suffering from such virus, and are we saying that this uh, uh, Zika, is it hereditary? If a mother happened to suffer it now, by giving back, with his own child put to rest, will he or she, that will she suffer such a virus in future? Okay. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I didn't get part of his question, but I did hear him ask whether it's hereditary. If you, the, you, you have an unborn child and the child gets the virus, is it likely that that child may pass it on? Josh, would you like to take the question? Yeah, I believe the question was around mm -hmm. whether you're infected, how yeah. long term are the consequences and mm -hmm. whether it can pass through through generations. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's any reason to believe that uh, it could be passed on uh, through generations. Um, really, the, 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 the link that we're worried about here is between a woman who is pregnant who is infected and their unborn child uh, developing birth defects. Uh, other than that, uh, there is uh, not too much of a concern and certainly not a concern across generations. So let's say a woman who is not pregnant who becomes infected uh, yet then clears the virus or recovers from the virus and no longer has the virus in their blood, there is no reason to believe that she would be at risk for uh, any serious health complications from Zika itself or if she gets pregnant in the future that that baby would be at risk for, for any complications either. Yeah, very interesting because one may wonder if you're pregnant and your child is already infected with that, what are the likelihood that this child is going to grow into a normal child? Will they have, you know, some mental challenges, you know, Dr. Ron? Those are some yeah. of the concerns. That's right, and it's a, we don't even know that because microcephaly has not been studied in as much detail as it might be. So there's a very, there's a wide range of consequences to children who are born with a small head size. Some people are entirely normal and will go about their lives just like the rest of us. We wouldn't even know to tell you. This is people, all of our heads are of different sizes, right? <laughs> yeah. So we wouldn't even know if someone happened to have a smaller size. But those people whose, uh, who, whose brains don't develop um, adequately in the uterus who may be born with a small head size, 
they may have a, a wide range of um, deficiencies growing up, anything from difficulties learning. Some people with microcephaly have difficulties moving around. Their nervous systems are affected. Uh, so difficulty seeing. There are a lot of vision difficulties. So it, it's a very wide range of symptoms. It, it's a tragic occurrence. It shouldn't be uh, diminished in its importance. And I think that um, doing whatever is possible to identify the cause of abnormalities in an unborn and then newborn child, anything that uh, can be done should be done. If there's an infectious disease cause, we need to definitely establish that fact and do everything we can to reduce the risk of infection. Carol, maybe I turn to you because also some of the concerns uh, from pregnant women is, as the doctors will advise you, don't take certain medication when you're pregnant. And of course, there are those uh, the trimester, the, what, the first, the second, and the third. And so everything varies. What are some of the issues that you're coming across as you report on the Zika virus? Well, some governments have told women not to get pregnant. And one government said, like, for 18 months, I believe, was the, was the term, not to get pregnant in the 18 months. Well, here in the United States, 50% of all births are not planned. So telling women not to get pregnant, unless you supply them with effective birth control, to my mind, it doesn't do very much good. And I would think it would be the same kind of challenge, even in Africa, where most of our audiences are, that you don't really know when you're going to get pregnant. And some of the, how do you even, some of them for religious and cultural purposes, they will say, no, you cannot tell me when I can get pregnant and when I cannot get pregnant. And maybe there'll be no measures to put in place. But Josh, as you look at uh, the kind of funding President Barack Obama is asking to be able to contain the Zika virus here in the United States and elsewhere. What are we really looking into? What kind of measures would be uh, put in place or what are we actually looking into? Right. As was said at the beginning of the, of the mm -hmm. hour here, there, there has been a request from President Obama to Congress mm -hmm. for $1.8 billion in additional funding uh, to address Zika. And that's both here in the United States and internationally, mainly uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Um, and, and this follows on the heels of several years ago uh, when a similar request was made uh, by the President of Congress for additional funding for Ebola. In that case, it was $5.4 billion. But in the uh, Zika case, uh, what the President is asking for is the additional money to really support the laboratory the surveillance research uh, needed to to um, understand more about the virus itself, how it's spreading, and also uh, to s inform the studies uh, of this link between the virus uh, in pregnancy and uh, the birth defects, but also mosquito control systems, um, public education uh, for the states in the United States, which may be um, at risk for Zika, and we've already seen uh, some uh, cases in the United States. Um, but also part of that money uh, for other countries to support their uh, efforts to control mosquitoes, to educate their public, and to do the research uh, and evaluation needed to understand more about the virus. Now it's up to Congress really to say uh, whether they agree with this amount or whether change the amount or change the emphasis, provide some limitations or, or uh, change it a, a bit according to their, their beliefs. Uh, and so we'll see how that process plays out. But it does seem that there is a bipartisan support for some kind of uh, additional budget on Zika. Well, very key because whatever comes out of this U.S. Uh, study and everything being put in place can be shared by the world. And on that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Josh Mitchell with the Kaiser Family Foundation, Dr. Ronald Waldman, a professor at George Washington University, and Carol Pearson, VOA's health reporter. Thanks to our affiliate stations along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Buddy. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to another edition of Straight Talk Africa. Good night from Washington.